Hello YouTube, this is Eric from Coder Snacks. Today, we're going to make a boggle solver. Let's get started. I've seen many references to this problem, and it's great for understanding depth-first search. It also has an interesting, if not very useful, dynamic programming solution at the end. What is Boggle? Boggle is a word-finding game. You get a square grid of letters, and you can form words by connecting these letters together. Unlike normal word-finding grid puzzles, you can go different directions in the same word. For example, in this grid, you can form the word minty by connecting letters like this. Usually, words must be three letters long and can't use the same tile twice. Before coding, let's ask a few questions. What sizes of boards should we accept? Do we have any runtime or space constraints? How will we get the dictionary? Also, how will we get the board? How can we connect tiles together? Can we connect them diagonally? Can we use the same letter multiple times? If you know the game well, you might ask questions like how to handle the Q tile or how to handle two letter long words. However, it shouldn't be held against you if you don't know the game that well. For this video, we'll make the following assumptions. We'll accept any size board. We're trying to minimize runtime. We can have the dictionary in any form we want. The board will be a list of strings that are all the same length, and we can connect letters diagonally, but not use the same letter multiple times. For simplicity, we'll also make the Q tile just be a Q. Let's imagine an algorithm to do this. Imagine we've picked a first letter. What can we do? We can go to any letter connected to this first letter. From each of those, we can go to any letter connected to the one we pick, and so on. However, we can't repeat letters, so we'll have to keep track of that. If you think of this board as a graph where the letters are vertices and links to neighbors are edges, this is similar to depth-first search. DFS suggests a recursive algorithm. Here's a recursive function we could use. Current word will be the word we're currently building, Used letters will be all the positions we visited building this current word, and current position will be where we currently are. The function will return the list of words we can create from this current state by recursively calling the function on all of the current position's neighbors. Some of this information could be redundant. If we made used letters a list, for example, we could reconstruct everything from that list. We know what's in cells 2, 2, 3, 1, and 3, 2, However, we'd like used letters to be a set later for faster lookup, and reconstructing the string each time is a pain anyway. Just keep in mind other directions we could go. Anyway, this means we can start with first letter, first letter, first letter for each of the letters in our grid, and combine the results for our final answer. What's our base case? Unlike the recursion we've written to this point, we don't have an explicit base case at the top of the function. When we have no more neighbors we can visit, we won't recurse further. This is effectively our base case. There are even other possibilities for what we're doing here. For one, we're using a set of used letters. In this case, since our grid is a fixed size, we could also use some sort of table that mirrors the grid to see which letters have been visited. In the general DFS case, a visited set or list is more normal, so that's what we've done here, but the list of lists is likely faster, so it's a good option to keep in mind. Let's write some code. We'll start by initializing a timer. For this problem, we want to illustrate how long some parts of the code take. We'll obtain a set of three letter or more words, and for each letter of our grid, we'll call our recursive function, passing the grid, the word list, a current word seated with the first letter, our current position, and a visited set seated with the first letter's position. Whew, that's a few arguments. When we're done, we'll return the set of all the words we found. Some words might be found in two different recursive calls, so we want to turn this into a set. Moving on to the meat of it, the recursive algorithm, if we enter the function and the word we're building is a word, we'll put that in our result list. Remember, our base case is implicit this time, so no base case at the top. For every neighbor, well, what is a neighbor? We're going to define a list of deltas pointing to each neighboring cell. So up and left is minus 1x and minus 1y, and so on. Anyway, for each neighbor, we calculate the new x and y coordinates, and recursively call find words, adding the new coordinate to used, and adding the new letter to our current word. We're doing one somewhat confusing thing with the set here. The more straightforward way would be to make a copy of our use set, add the letter, and then pass the copy into our recursive function. 
but this means a lot of copying. So instead, we pass the same set, and when we leave the recursive function, we remove the item. This is messy and might be premature optimization. The safer, cleaner way is to make a copy of the set. Finally, what's this inGrid function? Our neighbor's array has no sense of whether the neighbor is on the grid or not, so we make a function that returns true if we're inside the grid and false otherwise. When we run the program, it works fine for a 3x3 grid, but when we run it on a 4x4 grid, well, let's try to improve this. Before we continue, there's some confusion we should clean up about xy in this code. The grid is a list of strings, and so we have the y coordinate first, y being which string we're using, and x being the position in the string. But in some places in the code, we have x first, primarily in the neighboring code. We should be consistent so we don't confuse ourselves. Here's the cleaned up version. What's the runtime complexity of this code? It's difficult to calculate. From each letter, we can go at most eight ways, and we could go to n squared depth if we visit every letter, where n is the size of the side of the board. An upper bound for the complexity is eight to the n squared. It's less than this. Sometimes there are less choices because of edges and visited cells, but since this is a search tree, the complexity is certainly exponential. How can we improve this? What are we doing that's inefficient? First, we're following many paths that can't possibly be words. Let's look at this grid again. STXY can't possibly be a word, and in fact, there aren't any words that begin with STX. We should be able to stop at that point. How can we fix that? We want to say, we can't make a word that starts with STX, let's abort. This becomes a new base case for us, and there are a few ways to do it. Brute force is to check every word in the dictionary for something that starts with our prefix. We can do much better than that. Another way would be to do a binary search on a sorted version of the dictionary. This takes O of log n times s time, where n is the number of words in the dictionary and s is the length of your prefix, but there are two ways to do it in O of s time. First is to use a tree. No, a tree. Okay, let's explain. A tree, T-R-I-E, is a data structure where we can quickly look up whether a prefix is in our dictionary or not. Let's clear up the pronunciation thing first. It's based on retrieval, so the pronunciation is technically tree, but that's confusing, right? Many people call it a try instead, and to prevent confusion, we'll be doing the same here. A try is a type of tree, hush you, where each node represents some kind of a prefix. The root represents an empty prefix. Let's take the following dictionary, an, and, ant, and cat. To add and, we add a node for our a from the root. From that node, we add an edge for the next letter, n, which makes the prefix an. From that, we add an d for the prefix and. This final node we mark as a complete word for a reason we'll see in a moment. Next, let's add an. We already have an a node. We go into it. We also have an an node from there, and we go into that. That's the end of our word, and we mark it complete as well. The reason becomes clear. We can't just say that leaves represent completed words. We could have internal nodes of the tree that represent completed words that are prefixes of other longer words. Here, an is a prefix of and. Now we add ant. The a and an nodes are both there, and we add a node for ant from this an node, and mark it complete. Finally, to add cat, we make a new node from the root for c, then a, then t, and mark the node as complete. This completes our try. As a note, in this diagram for clarity, we're putting the prefixes in the nodes, but in the actual data structure this isn't necessary, which we'll see in a moment. Once we have a try, it's easy to see if a string is a prefix of a word in our dictionary. We follow the path for our prefix by following the appropriate edge for each letter. If we fall off the tree, the prefix isn't valid. For example, car is not a word in our dictionary. What happens if we look for it? We start at the root and look for a C edge. There is one and we follow it. Next we look for an A edge, which also exists. Then we look for an R edge, but there isn't one. This means that no word that begins with car is in our dictionary. Let's write the code to make the try and look up words in it. We start with initializing our try object. 
we'll have a default dict where the keys are letters, the edges, and the values are the new nodes, or tries. Additionally, we'll set a complete flag to false. It seems like we wouldn't need the complete flag for our purposes, since we're only checking prefixes. If we have the try, however, we can also replace our dictionary lookup with the try, so let's include it. Next, how do we add a word? We take a string and write a recursive add function. Our base case is the empty string, and in that case we mark complete as true for the current node. Otherwise, we go into the child corresponding with the first letter of the string and recurse with the substring not containing the first letter. Because we're using a default dict, if the child doesn't exist, it's automatically created. Next, check word. There are two cases for us. Either we care whether the word exists or whether the prefix exists. These two functionalities are nearly identical, so we combine them into one function, check word. Our base case is the empty string again. If the string is empty and we're doing a prefix check, we return true. Otherwise, we only return true if this node represents a complete word. Otherwise, if the next letter is a child, we recurse, and if not, we return false, because the edge doesn't exist. Finally, to see a little better if the try is working, we'll make a show try method to show us what the try looks like. In an interview setting, you wouldn't need to write this. Let's see how we did. We'll make a try, add the words of our example dictionary, and show the try. Looks good. Next, we'll write some test cases to see if various prefixes and words work in the try. Also looks good. This try takes O of n s to construct, where n is the number of words in the dictionary and s is the number of letters in the average word. But the lookup is faster than before, O of s. This means we can efficiently look up whether a prefix has any possible words or not. The disadvantage of a try in an interview setting is this code. This is a lot of code to get right for an auxiliary data structure. There are a couple ways to handle this. First, you could assume you have a reasonable try implementation already to do writing it, and come back if you have time and if the interviewer is interested. Second is to use a prefix set instead. A prefix set is just a set of all the prefixes of all the words. We can then check whether our prefix is in this set. This is much easier to implement. To make a prefix set, iterate over every word in the dictionary and add all the prefixes of each word, including the word itself, to a set. Here's the, uh, code. This set also takes O of n s to construct. The disadvantage of a prefix set is it may take more space, and the lookup, while still O of s, due to the hash function of the string, is likely to be slower. In an interview setting, I would probably write the prefix set, note to the interviewer that a try might be better, and to do it for after finishing the main algorithm. Let's add this prefix set to our implementation. We have to make the prefix set at the beginning, and we'll add a timer for this as well. Then, we have to pass it into our find words implementation, and when we find that our current word isn't in the prefix set, we return an empty list. We can't possibly make any more words. Let's run our test case. This is clearly faster than the original implementation. What didn't complete in several seconds before takes 0.2 seconds now. Even running a random 100 by 100 grid only takes 3 seconds. But what's the runtime complexity? Unfortunately, it's the same. In the very worst case, every word is in the dictionary, and we don't ever trim any paths. But, for realistic looking boggle boards and dictionary, this solution is much better. The worst case here with an infinite dictionary is really unrealistic. One optimization we could make is to have a boggle solver class and only make the prefix set in word list once. It's the same for every call to find words. Then, we also wouldn't have to pass them around. These optimizations still don't improve the overall runtime complexity. Can we improve the overall runtime complexity? When we want to improve the runtime complexity of a recursive algorithm, we should consider memoization and dynamic programming. Let's look at memoization. What would we have to memoize in this function? We'd have to cache the current word, y, x, and the used set. This is possible, but the number of recursive calls you'd have to cache is huge. The number of current words is equal to the size of the prefix set, x and y are each size n, and the number of different possible used sets is 2 to the n squared. Each of the n squared squares is in it or not. 
it could still save you some time. You can imagine cases where you have pairs of letters next to each other and you'd prune off some paths. Here, for example, you could get to the I in assist two different ways. But the memoization table is still exponential in size, and so a memoized solution is still exponential time. There is a different dynamic programming solution, however. Imagine you're trying to find a specific word in the boggle board, let's say mint. We could find the instances of the first letter in the board, then from each of those look for the second letter and so on, and if you find a path with the full word, then the word is there. It's kind of like what we've been doing for DFS. Instead though, we can do this using dynamic programming. We take a grid and initialize it to true for each instance of our first letter in the grid. Then, for the next letter, we make another grid for the second letter. For each position in our new grid, we mark it as true if the letter in our board matches, in green, and a neighbor of it was true in the previous grid, in red. At the end, if any of the cells are true, we can make the word, maybe. The dp runs in O of n squared times length of word, but the maybe is a problem. There's no check in this dp solution to see if we've used a cell twice. We could try to fix this by storing the path we took to get to some particular cell instead of a true or a false. But if there are multiple ways to get to a cell, we'd have to store all of them, or at least all the sets of visited cells, and we're back to exponential time. Once we reach the end of this dp solution, instead, we have to check if we can actually construct the word using the method we discussed before, which is exponential in the worst case. In practice, the dp solution with checking doesn't work better than our recursion with prefixes solution, so we're not going to implement it here. It would also be extremely difficult to get to the dp solution in an interview. In practice, and in an interview setting, a recursive solution that implements depth-first search with pruning via a prefix set or try is the best solution I know of. If you know of a better solution, let me know in the comments. However, there are some variants of this problem where DP is great, which brings us to our challenges. First, try implementing a solution where it doesn't matter if you reuse letters and implement it using dynamic programming. Find out yourself if DP runs faster than the recursive solution. Next, you could implement a boggle board generator. You could also make a board generator where many words can be found to try to stress test our solution in this code. If you use random letters, this code does a 100 by 100 grid in a few seconds, but you can make the grid far more difficult than that. How? Finally, you could try writing a parallelized solution. Since the subproblems of each starting letter aren't related, you could parallelize this solution to make it faster using the multiprocessing module. I'll put a link in the description. Next time, it's brackets and braces and parens. Oh my! Write a function that takes a string with brackets, braces, and parens and returns whether or not the string is balanced or not. I hope you got something out of this video. If you have any questions, comments, something I've missed, or problems you want answered or covered, let me know in the comment section below. And if you enjoyed this video and want to see more, it would be great if you liked the video, subscribed, or both. I really appreciate it. See you here next time on Coder Snacks.